STS would like to thank Medtronic for their generous support and sponsorship of this webinar and the STS Summer Series. Today's topic is Saver versus Taver, Controversial Cases and Insights from the Experts. We want to make this webinar as interactive as possible and hear from you, the audience. To this end, you may enter questions through the Q&A feature in Zoom. The panelists will try to respond to as many questions as possible. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available tomorrow morning on the STS website, STS YouTube channel, and the STS Surgical Hot Topics podcast. At this time, I am pleased to welcome our moderators for this session, Dr. Gaurav Alwadi and Dr. Yoshi Kaneko. Dr. Alwadi is Chief of Cardiac Surgery and Director of Minimally Invasive Cardiac Surgery at the University of Virginia. And Dr. Kaneko is a cardiac surgeon and Surgical Director of the Structural Heart Program at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Assistant Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Alwadi, Dr. Kaneko, I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you, Wesley. I uh, would like to thank, uh, first of all, the audience for finding time uh, to uh, learn about this topic. As you all know, uh, aortic stenosis has gone through a dramatic change in how we treat patients. Uh, and we as surgeons are really on the front lines treating both surgery with surgery as well as with TAVR. Um, and there are still many gray areas. And this is, uh, session is really designed to try to go over some of those controversial areas where there isn't always a right decision. Um, well, the format of this is uh, we have four cases and we're gonna to try to spend about 15 minutes on each case. Uh, and we have, we'll present the case, either Dr. Kaneko or I will present the case. And we have four panelists, uh, four experts. If you notice it's two cardiac surgeons and two cardiologists. And I'll ask Dr. Kaneko to introduce our panelists. Great, thank you, Gaurav. Uh, so we have a world-class panelist today, um, starting with Dr. Vini Bapat, who recently relocated. Um, he is the chief of cardiac surgery at Minneapolis Heart Institute. And of course, he's the founder of the Valve and Valve app. We can all ask him why he did not charge for those apps. He would have been a millionaire by now. Dr. Adam Greenbaum is a co-director of Structural Heart Program at Emory. He is a world expert on procedures that require expertise on the electrocardiac interventions. So procedures like transcable procedure, basilica, lampoon, that's his uh, specialty and we're gonna ask him a lot of questions about these procedures today. Dr. Molly Zerlap is the uh, director of, medical director of structural heart program at Baylor Scott. And I sort of consider her as the mother of the structural heart um, conferences. You know, you see her everywhere and she takes care of everything and she is sort of the big mother figure in this field. And Dr. Vino Thurani, we don't really need an introduction for him. He's the chair at um, Piedmont for cardiac surgery. And um, he's gonna show you um, the proper dress um, for the Zoom meeting today, uh, you will see in a second. So I would like to start the case here um, by you know, presenting my own case. So the first case that I'm going to present is a 65 year old female um, with increasing shortness of breath over the past six months. Um, she has history of COPD. It's somewhat questionable of history of alpha one antitrypsin deficiency, no past surgical history. Um, she's a small lady. So height was 175.5 centimeters, 46 kilos, BSA of 1.43 square meters. And the PFTs, the FEV1 was 41% predicted. Um, so I would put this in sort of a moderate um, COPD range. And the STS prom was 1.9 for aortic valve replacement. So I would think that this is low risk, but based on the uh, pulmonary risk, it's, um, it's definitely a intermediate risk. So sort of borderline. When you look at the echo, she definitely has severe aortic stenosis. The peak velocity is over four with mean grade of 37 millimeters of mercury. And we got the TAVR CT scan and the access was not great. Um, still doable, I believe. And I'll ask um, you know, the panelists about this, but uh, the minimal luminal diameter was 4.2 on the right side and 4.3 on the left side. And when we measure the annulus, the annulus was small. So based on the area, it was 316 square millimeters and the circumference was um, 65. And when you measure the, uh, the diameter, it was 16 by 22.9, 16 by 23 millimeters. So, um, and the coronary heights were okay. And the coronary angiogram, I sort of skipped, but it was, um, it was normal. So to summarize, this is a 65 year old female with severe AS 
moderate COPD with FEV1 of 41% predicted, small BSA of 1.43, SDS prom of 1.9, but because of the pulmonary risk, probably in the intermediate risk. And CT scan shows borderline iliacs and small annulus. So what would the panelists do in this case? So would we pick a 20 millimeter sapien three valve um, based on the size, 23 millimeter Evolute Pro, Saver with root enlargement with Nix procedure, Saver with root enlargement with Manugian procedure, Saver with freestyle or any other object. So I'm gonna go one by one. Um, Molly, um, if, you can, um, if you can sort of summarize and see what you think of this case. So I have a couple of questions first. So yeah. I think the perimeter was 65, you said? Yes. And what was the area? Area was 314. Okay, and then do you know what your sinuses were? The sinuses were relatively generous. It was about uh, 24, 25. 20, uh, 24, 25, okay. So you're right, so it would be, actually it doesn't really fit very well with even a. 23 because you need for a 23 evolute pro you would need sinuses that are two millimeters more um so you would want the average to be 25. now it does fit a 20 sapien 3 so let me ask you a question if you were doing a saver would you do a root enlargement because she's a small woman and her bsa she'd probably fit a smaller i mean i wouldn't necessarily think that you would need a root enlargement so if you were doing if you weren't going to do a root enlargement then i think in this particular person a 20 sapien would be okay if she was bigger then you know and it was a, a mismatch you know then i and you were going to do a root enlargement then I would go with Saver. But if you, since she's a really small lady, and if you were not going to do a root enlargement, then a 20 sapien would be okay. Okay. Thanks, Molly. I'm going to punt that, um, that root enlargement question to Vinny. Um, Vinny, if you can comment on what you think and what, would, what you would have done or what you would do in this particular patient. So I think the first thing is uh, the lung issue is a red herring. She's a small lady, so FEV1 of one is normal for her. Her DLCO is 79 to 80, so I don't think the respiratory risk is a big issue in her. Um, looking at her BSA, I think a 19 size uh, Inspiris valve, for example, uh, may be enough for her. And just looking at her BSA and uh, area to avoid, you know, PPM would be around 1.3. So. I think in this particular patient, there's not much calcium around. You can put in a 19 valve without any issue. Uh, I, I would prefer to put a 19 in Spiris more than a 20 S3. Uh, and the reason being, you know, we have reasonable data on 19 size Magna East, for example, um, in such patients. And uh, she's 65. She doesn't have any other big comorbidities. And it can give us a reasonable opportunity to do uh, one size higher wall in wall in future if she comes back. So preferably avoid doing anything. I always think that root enlargement is spoken more on the conference podiums than really done. So I think 19, if you can get in her, it will be enough to avoid severe PPM. Okay. Vino, um, do you have any comments? I think you... Yeah, you know, so Vinny, I, I think that... Um... I think that you could, I, for her, when I think about the management, your you're, you're a couple of things that you said that are very important. Um, number one is that she's only 65. I think her lung disease, her ELC is normal, her FEV1 is low. It's actually in a severe category because it's less than 50% is considered severe by the SDS criteria. So she technically has severe COPD because she had a 41% FEV1 predicted. And DLCO is not part of the SDS criteria uh, for severe COPD. So what I would say is that I would do a root enlargement and put a 21 in her. Because if you think about the management lifetime for her, she's only 65. She's going to most likely 75 or something, need something done. And I'd rather do, have a 21 to work with than a 19 to work with. Because I do think that there does become an issue potentially for her. And you're setting her up not for this operation. I think you're 100% right for this operation. But for the next operation, I'd rather do a valve and valve in a 21 than a valve and valve in a 19. Let me ask something. What is what are the and, and then I want to add Adam also. Maybe you could start with this question, and then everybody else can weigh in after Adam talks about his decision. But what do you all think about 
the likelihood that this patient at 65 will survive to need another aortic valve procedure. So think about that, Adam, let's hear your, your opinion. Sure, I have to apologize. I had some uh, catastrophic laptop failure here, so I was off for a second, but what was the height of the STJ? Um, did, we, did anyone mention the, it? You know, the height of the STJ, I didn't calculate, but the coronary were pretty high. So, you know, you can see that the waist is probably about here, and the coronary height was 15 here. So I would guess that it's going to be somewhere between 13 to 15 right. millimeters. Yeah. So sometimes when I look at the small route to make this decision about SAVR first, TAVR first, putting all things aside, if I think that maybe that, that 20S3 is not going to get to the STJ uh, so that you could maybe follow that up with the TAV and TAV, um, or for that matter, the same thing with the 23 Evolute. If you thought that you weren't going to create a tube skirt or get into coronary obstruction risks by occlusion at the level of the STJ, you could think about the TAVR valve first to start you off with a bigger platform and then either go to surgery the second time and then and then back to TAVR or maybe TAV and TAV first. So I do use the STJ and what I think my chances are of being able to perform TAV and SAV or TAV and TAV at the time um, of the first procedure so that I sort of can get a better idea. You know, so so Adam, you can look at Adam, the heights you, of Adam, yeah. Adam do you, don't you think that we have unbelievably little amount of data in a TAV and TAV and a 20 S3? Oh, I mean, of I course, think that, right. I, That's right. I think that, I mean, then you're, you're looking at your internal orifice is going to be potentially, you can't, you can't um, crack it or whatever, right? You, it's chrome and cobalt. It's going to be very difficult to do that. So no doubt about it that when you need something for a TAV and TAV down the road in a 20 S3, you're going to be looking at probably intern dominant of 16, right? right. Potentially. So, so at 16 you know, to 15, so I think that becomes potentially, I don't, I don't know the right answer because we don't have any data on it. And I was going to ask you if you knew any data on that. I think so, it, a, a valve and valve in a 20, I think would be catastrophic. So yeah, that's, what, that's, that's why I bring that up. Mom. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have already learned from surgical valves, right? Small valves don't work very well. The amount of metal in that small root will be so much. I don't think means that would be a choice. But I think we knew this is an interesting point you made about 21 versus 19. And the more we have looked into it, this is the most interesting part about, so to speak, effect of root enlargement or uh, valve cracking, et cetera, is that the bigger valve you put in and you know the root enlargement, there was a nice picture on the slide. Uh, what we tend to enlarge is between, of course, left and the non. Uh, is There is a chance that when you put in a bigger valve, one is the mm -hmm. orientation of valve changes, uh, but also the fact that more we fracture and expand these valves in future, uh, the, the leaflets are going to go nearer the coronary. Right. So I think it's a balance. And again, I, I don't know the answer, but I think sometimes I look at it in more simpler way of, you know, the sinuses are around 25. If 19 can avoid BS it, you know, the issue of PPM today. And I can, I know definitely I can increase the inspiris to one size larger later. It will not increase. But, so Vinny, get, answer this question. I think maybe this is the heart of it. Comparing the three yeah. choices that you guys have proposed, a 19 inspiris, a 21, may, potentially a frackable valve or an inspiris, and a 20 sapien, what size tablet can you get in each of those three? So 19 inspiris, if I can answer, uh, the true ID of 19 inspiris without expanding is around 18 to 17. But once you expand it, it increases to at least 19 or 20. And one good thing about Inspiris on bench testing, we know that you don't have to actually use a high pressure balloon to do it. So yeah. I think what about that is for the, the tw a 20 uh, Sapien and a tw or a 21? It's, I would use a 19 Inspiris in this patient. <laughs> uh, if she lives, so, but, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I can so treat what? it better. Can I just bring up root replacement though? I mean, what, you know, if you do a lot of root replacement, I know it's a, it's a and now there's a new connect device, which actually has an inspiris built into a gel weave graft, right? If you do a lot of root replacements, I know it's aggressive, but you do set this patient up for probably a 23 inspiris, right? Because once you take everything out, I know it's a radical procedure and a lot of people don't do roots, but a lot of people who do do roots, 
it's a, you know, it can be a 75, 85 minute cross clamp time. I mean, I'm just bringing that up that I, I don't think we can forget about roots on these patients. Just FYI. Yeah. Although it's interesting because sometimes then, then the, the limiting area of flow is no longer, it's obviously not the valve, but the subvalvular apparatus is yep. too small. So you might not gain as much as you think by replacing the root. But I mean, the internal diameter of the prosthesis is always smaller than that, right? So, you know, if you can actually put a bigger valve on top and expand it, you know, the patient will have a physiologic flow, right? Yeah. How they were born with. So I, I think there's some, there's some truth to what Vino said. I mean, root replacement. So there, there are a couple questions that came in through the audience. Maybe we'll just spend one minute answering them. So what, what do people think about the Percival valve? I know Vino's got a lot of experience with Percival. Yeah, I did um, uh, for the initial trial. And I haven't done them more because of uh, because of the cost and associated with that. I didn't find any shorting the cross current time by five or six minutes really helped me very much. And I know Mahesh has a great question on that. I think Percival is an option for this. You would get a Percival. Um, the data for valve and valve in that is uh, scarce, but it still uh, is possibly set up. I'm not worried about the first operation. I'm worried about the future operation yeah. for this patient. Yeah, uh, so Percival, I think, I think Percival is an option. I do think yeah. Percival is an option. Percival. I agree. And I think the Percival might actually give you, if you talk about diameter, it might actually uh, give you the better diameter than a 19 uh, valve. Maybe not the Inspiris, but a 19 valve. Yep. You know, it's no, I think Marish has a good point there. All right. Yoshi, would well, you? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you what I did. Um, I, you know, the patient actually made it easy. She wanted only one surgery done. So I actually put a mechanical valve in. Yeah, all right. <laughs> and I did a root. I was, I was thinking about that. I didn't want to, you, you, right. Listen, you didn't put that. You didn't put that on your question. No, no, no. 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 I, I, I didn't specifically say mechanical valve or biprosthetic valve. I mean, <laughs> so you changed. I mean, now we know the ground rules. The ground rules are there are no ground rules. <laughs> right, right, right. So what would you do? So I did a root enlargement though, because um, it would barely fit in a 19. So I did a Nix and then put a 21. Um, mean gradient was three. So I think um, at the end of the day, hopefully this will serve her well. She did well from the operation. Let me ask this. So what does everybody think about her longevity, her life expectancy, 65? Well, now, 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 now she has got mechanical wall and warfarin. It has become less now. <laughs> 80. She should live in, with no other color base, she should live in the 80s. Yeah, uh, but she's got severe COPD. Yeah, you said that. 15, no, but her DLTO is good. Less. Her DLTO yeah. is good. It is good. All right, should we move well, on? That's good. Yep. All right, I go see, as you see, we got clear, clear as mud answers here, and I think that's the. the I think that's right, the yeah. point, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's why they're hard teams. Otherwise, <laughs> none of us would have jobs. All right. So the next case uh, is one from UVA. One of my uh, one of my colleagues. I uh, had this case. It's a 74-year-old male, re retired orthopedic surgeon, essentially no real symptoms. He was an avid golfer, is an avid golfer, followed for years by his cardiologist, and he was sent to the valve center because his were getting substantially high. You could see by echo, and I didn't show all these pictures, but his gradient was up to 55. Velocity was well over 500. Um, he'd had a history of carotid artery occlusion due to spontaneous dissection 10 years prior. Although really no, no symptoms from that, no stroke, hypertension, thyroid nodules. You can go to the next slide. Uh, and his aortic uh, root and ascending were, were uh, not, um, they were mildly large, but they're not large enough to warrant uh, replacement. Uh, they were, um, I think, in the low fours. Uh, and you can see, I just wanted to show uh, his bicuspid valve. He does have a fair amount of calcium on his valve. Next slide. And here's just some uh, measurements. If we're thinking about a, a TAVR option. This is just below the valve. His perimeter was 85 and annual area is 555. Next slide. And he had adequate femoral access. So I think there's many options here. He's essentially asymptomatic, but has you know what some will call critical aortic stenosis. Um, here are some of the options we were thinking of. Maybe Vino has come up with others, but a saver, a taver. If you do a taver, which valve with this heavy calcium, Evolute versus a Sapien, uh, a stress test because you know he doesn't, he's not really symptomatic, and watchful waiting. So I'll turn it over to the panelists. Who wants to start? I'll go. All right. Well, well, his STS I would assume would be low given. Yeah, his STS was under two. It was it was a little more than one. 
Yeah, so um, for bicuspids with low risk, we still universally uh, go to SAVR first, um, unless the patient is like adamant against uh, SAVR, then we still try to talk them into SAVR. And if they still don't want it, then maybe um, uh, TAVR. But in a low risk patient with that bicuspid valve, I mean, it's pretty symmetric. So it's not, um, I mean, so you would think that it would be okay with TAVR, but it's very calcified. The RAFA is, I mean, it's pretty calcified, so it's a higher risk of stroke. So for this guy, who's very uh, active and low risk, I would offer SAVR, and since that's a class, I believe it's a class, either a class one or a class two B uh, um, uh, recommendation for asymptomatic critical AS, then I would SAVR. But still for TAVR, asymptomatic critical AS is still not, theoretically an indication. So that's what I would do. Uh, heard, the, heard that from the cardiologist. Adam, what do you think about, would you do any other testing, stress test, or would you wait, or would you offer something? Well, can you guys hear me okay? A little bit hard to hear you. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I would, I think that uh, SABR is probably a better way to go at the start for these bicuspids too. I, I don't, I mean, it's pretty eccentric. There may get a leak on the side. I understand the data looks pretty, pretty good from what they published so far, but it's heavily calcified leaflet. So I would consider seven. And, and which valve would you use? I mean, like you said, it's heavily calcified. So does that weigh into your decision about which valve? You mean if I was going to do TAVA? Yeah. I, I think the, if you can, can you get go back to the picture in, in those cases, and I, you don't have a long axis. You don't have a long axis view, do you? No, so see if, the, uh, if, the, if it's all in to Adam's point, if we're going to more in the just the leaflets, or is it going down into the LVOT no, or the, the anterior LVOT leaflet of the microvalve? Was, LVOT was not that heavily calcified. So let, let me ask uh, Molly and Adam. So for bicuspids, assuming that they're you know intermediate high riskish patient um, or intermediate risk, I would say. Um, when would you do a TAVR in bicuspids? You know, are you, do you look at more of the anatomy and what kind of anatomy is suitable for TAVR? Um, so if it's an intermediate risk over 80 year old, then I have no problem doing a bicuspid. Um, if it's a, you know, 70 year old or, you know, intermediate risk, then um, it would really depend on the anatomy. If it's very eccentric, you know, then, um, and very calcified. And because again, the calcification um, is a higher risk of stroke. We may, um, you know, we may lean towards SAVR, um, but, but for a low risk patient, definitely lean towards SAVR. You know, intermediate and high, either one. And if it was, uh, if there was a lot of calcium that went down into the LVOT, probably a self-expanding valve. And actually, if it's intermediate risk, I take, um, we would probably put them in the Lotus trial uh, for bicuspids or something like that. You yeah. know, most of our patients like that would go into a trial. Sure. All right, Vinny, you know, what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I think this is very interesting listening to, you know, the whole conversation is, uh, one is, of course, can we get a really good result with TAVR in this anatomy? That's one question. Uh, the second thing is most of the experience we have at present is very early results. And we know very well two things. Is one, uh, when we excise these valves surgically, they generally are very large. So you can implant a really good size surgical valve. Their sinuses are big, so even future valve in valve, et cetera, is quite easy. Uh, the second thing we also know that which if TAVR self-expanding, if you use, uh, they are pretty, uh, I would say deformed, it's a wrong word, but they are not definitely circular. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the durability and questions, et cetera, long-term or mid-term become questionable. So I agree with Molly, but I think we are a bit more conservative about it. We feel even intermediate risk uh, patients should go for SAVR uh, if the anatomy is like this. Uh, the RAFE is extremely calcified and you're going to get uh, eccentric uh, deployment. You know, what do you think? Uh, so the question is, is, is he really asymptomatic? If he's completely asymptomatic, uh, I think, you know, you have to think about a stress test for this patient, even if it's a little bit, just to make sure that 
you're doing the right thing, you know, if you look at the guidelines, we don't always follow a guideline, but it is something to keep in, in important that you are following some pathway for this. If I remember correctly, you think the degree of gradient it, makes a difference in that recommendation. I, I, was, I was trying to remember what that was. It was over five, right? The, the, yeah, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the V max. The VMAX was over five and the gradient was um, let me see. high, right? Yeah, isn't gradient. it a 2A indication for surgery? Yeah, yeah. it's critical. Yeah, it's critical A, yeah. Critical yeah, okay, yeah. Just, I'll tell you, and now go back, yeah, also has carotid occlusion and stuff, right? Yeah, I actually, it's, I misspoke. It's Apparently it's a vertebral uh, dice. Okay, yeah, that's fine. So look, I mean, I think I would offer this, I would offer this to this patient and, and I'm assuming he also doesn't have aortic uh, disease, aortic root spine, no. anything aortic I mean, right. It's, it's a little large, but it's not aneurysmal, not by Yeah, so I, I would tell you at this point, I'd ask the patient and ask, you know, tell him the pros and cons for it and let him decide. I would use a safe and free personally uh, for these patients uh, to what Vinny said. Yeah. Ask the patient. I think that you could do either. I've successfully done both of them. I think intermediate risk probably does lean on the higher end of intermediate risk, does lead towards TAVR and the high risk obviously go towards TAVR. The low intermediate and the low risk tend to go towards surgery. But I also bring the patient into it and ask him, he's a, he's a physician, so he gets it a little bit, more so than some of our patients where we actually have to tell what to do. And I'd ask the, I'd ask the patient and let him be a part of the decision making instead of um, just ramming something down his throat. So it seems like we're, we're Everybody's split here. We got a couple for TAVR, a couple for SAVR, but it doesn't fall along your specialty line. So that's, that's uh, exactly what we want to hear. Yep. And there is no right answer. So we go to the next slide. Um, so uh, he was offered uh, offered both, actually, he's offered surgery first. And he really wanted to avoid surgery. Again, the guy's pretty asymptomatic. And he thought, hey, if I can get treated with a TAVR, why not? He's an avid golfer and he wanted to resume his life. So he get, goes to the cath lab, gets a TAVR. We did not do a stress test given his, uh, given his of AS. And in the cath lab, they do a BAB because he is pretty calcified and crossing the valve was, was a little difficult. And you can go to the next slide. Yep. You technically call them a Seaver zero. Am I right about that? I think it's a one. Vin. It's a yeah. bad one. Yeah. I, 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 from that one image, it's hard to tell. From. Yeah, yeah the yeah, but left corner is, sure. is on the um, screen right. All right, and so there's, he comes there's no the doubt that the that the three sinus bicuspids do better mm -hmm. than the two sinus, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So he becomes uh, hypotensive with the BAB. What do you guys think is going on? You tore his leaflet. Okay. So everybody presume that. Mind you, he's awake. You know, awake. So. Uh, gets hypotensive, and so we quickly proceed with, uh, presuming he's got AI, and put a TAVR in. So go to, go to the next slide. Yep. And here's, um, well, anyway, you, you can presume that we open the TAVR up. I did want to play, if you play that second one, and we landed it pretty well, uh, but it's hard to tell on this, but there is a the little... Pericardial effusion? A little mm -hmm. bit of an effusion that started. Yeah. Correct. You can see the left side of the screen is outside the aortic line. Yeah. Contour. This is what I meant by eccentric deployment. Yeah. And I think this is, I've experienced it like many years ago when we mis misdiagnosed it as tricuspid. So. Yeah, you can keep going, Yoshi. Yep. Um, so I want to do, I do want to get through the other cases. So further hypotension, effusion was noted, had a drain placed, had a fair amount of blood out, was put on femoral, femoral bypass and intubated, then we got a TE. If you go to the TE, the next slide, and what you can see is a, a pretty good hematoma of yeah. the aortic root. Yeah. And with, with continued bleeding from his pericardial drain, he was emergently open. And uh, my partner, Dr. Yao, did a tremendous job uh, doing a uh, repair of the an annulus that ruptured is right below the right coronary artery, had to essentially do a biobentol with a 25 millimeter valve. Um, Long that does bring up the controversy of, of the self-expanding versus the balloon expandable, right? If you're going to go this route, That's some people point. feel that less chance of a rupture with, with the self-expanding, but, but, but maybe a higher chance of leak. You know? Yeah. Right. And that's what I think the, the recent uh, publication in circulation comparing balloon expandable versus uh, self-expanding for bicuspid. I think it was uh, the beat trial or beat registry, something like that. Uh, just this week, um, noted that too, that there was high, a small but higher risk of annular rupture with the balloon expandable, but a fair of hour leak rate 
with the uh, self-expanding. And go to what was the Sapien 3 size which you used? Uh, that's a good question. I believe it was a 29. It was, was a, yeah, say, it a, maybe a 29. So I think some of the data also coming out in bicuspid, especially who have got a severe rafa calcification, is that uh, your oversizing has to be really minimal. Yeah. And I think this is something we have learned. And the other thing in my own practice I do regularly is when it's calcified like that, I see the leaflet excursion because if one leaflet is really immobile, it puts the, you know, means I unfortunately have been involved in a case where the sapient tore into the left and right atrium as well. Uh, it was an extreme case. And this was very early days. We didn't know a lot of things. Uh, you know, oversizing was, uh, definitely. Should yeah, there was avoided. a presentation at EuroPCR from the Cedar Sinai group that looked at uh, the calcification of yeah. um, of the bicuspids. Yeah, it did show that when you have a calcified rafe, they do worse, and yeah. I think they have higher chance of rupturing. They have higher chance of PBL. So I think these are the ones that we would be a little aggressive to do surgery on. Uh, yeah. When there's no calcium in the rafe, I think TAVR can work okay. Of course, we don't know the long term outcomes, but. And wasn't there a little bit of in, in the in the right coronary sinus? There was a ball of calcium down there, wasn't there? In the that, that big raffe, I mean, it, it was basically right underneath, underneath the coronary. And then underneath, go, go to the next one. There's a little bit yeah, right there, right there at uh, seven yes. o'clock. And that right there <laughs> would tear too. So. Yeah. So that's on the left side. I think that that, that, raffae, is that, that calcified Sorry. raffae uh, yeah. probably went right underneath the right corner of the artery. Yeah, right here. So. Right. yeah, we probably <laughs> should talk about the balloon for bicuspids. I mean, is that, uh, I mean, our experience, we, it's very rare that we do that, even, even if it's tight. I mean, yeah, I think part of the ballooning um, was to size it as well to get a more confirmation but yeah i think that's that, that's something to consider now at the same time i'm not sure that would have changed the outcome adam there are people we generally, we generally I mean, don't but i agree with adam we generally don't yeah uh, i'd say that yeah, we don't one, one in 50 do we balloon here so yeah there, there are school of thoughts thinking that uh, you know all bicuspids should be ballooned. Um, I think we have to understand that too. So I, I don't think there's a good consensus here. We, I, and we the so, other thing is it's severe stenosis. So would you have problem when you cross and you're struggling again? Uh, you know. If you're gonna balloon it, you have to. I mean, if you're worried about crossing with the valve, I think you just use something like a 16, 18, 20 balloon. You don't really do an aggressive BAV. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I mean, this is a right. surgical. This is a surgical webinar. So I mean, we're you know, we've had cases where this patient obviously should have had surgery in a hindsight, but there are patients who've had bicuspids who do very well. So yeah. I, mean, I think there's a balance. And this one, I think, with the surgeons who are in the heart team, this is one that probably should have gone through surgery only in hindsight. And sometimes, this I struggle with, and maybe you guys can comment, patients want to take us into one direction. And I said that even on my comment. But somehow we have to turn the boat sometimes and take them away from their want, which is go back to golf game right away. Yep. We have to be careful in that. I think, you know, we can't, if we think it should be surgery, then just stick with it and not, not stay with it, not, not worry about them going across town. You don't have to worry about that in Charlottesville, but we do in Dallas and Boston yep. and Atlanta. We have to worry about them going across town to get a tavern. Now I think we have to maybe stick to our guns a little bit. That's yeah. I was actually being going to say the same thing. I mean, this is one of the main reasons. I mean, um, we really don't know what to do in bicuspids. And in high-risk patients, bicuspids, yeah, I mean, it, they're high-risk. So, you know, either way is high-risk. But in low-risk patients, because we really don't know what to do in a bicuspid or, or how it's going to, to play out, you're right, it's surgical disease. And especially with physicians, when your physicians are patients, I think we have to be a little bit more uh, assertive in telling them that no really a surgery is better for you you know sometimes we think that when we talk with with other doctors who are patients you know that they understand or get it but sometimes i i don't think that that's the case i think that we we do i mean we're the experts right and so i think that we do need to to be a little bit more uh, assertive and and you know a lot of times with these low risk by cuspids we don't we, we kind of almost don't give them the choice yeah, because yeah. We, yeah. i do think that everybody wants a tavern 
right? Yeah, everybody, everybody wants, wants er, yeah. everybody comes to the office wanting a cavern. We have to talk them potentially out of it. And that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah I think the amount of calcium uh, on this and in many of the bicuspids are what we should be looking at. It. For me as a surgeon to take home is a lot of calcium. I'm very worried about the bicuspid. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Gorb, is he going back to playing golf? That's all I want to know. I believe so. Yeah, I think he's recovered. I mean, this is last fall. So. You know, I, I, I always tell my patients that with surgery, we can also fix their handicap and with tower, we can. Yes or no question. Do you use embolic protection device for bicuspid? On your bicuspid specifically. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, I do as I do as well. I I do think there's pretty good data that there's more calcium and that the stroke risk may be a little higher for Tyler. Yeah. yeah. So I all agree. four said yes. Yeah. Yoshi, do yeah. you guys? Yeah, we do for bicuspids. Interesting. We don't. We don't use them for. We saw more strokes with the those devices. But at least well, I mean, you know, McCarr's paper showed that. You know, even in the TBT registry, I think we're it had a, it had a uh, double stroke rate compared to tri leaflet aortic valve. Yep. yep. All right, let's go to the next case. Good discussion, guys. All right, so next one's, a, next one's my case. Um, another retired physician. So 78-year-old male, status post. This is a bad predictor. Oh, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> Just a theme today. So he had an AVR um, and cabbage times two. So AVR was 21 millimeter mitral flow. This is important. So I'm going to emphasize this. 21 millimeter mitral flow. And the cabbage was Lima to LAD and the vein graft to PDA. And it's been over 10 years. Um, the patient had heart failure exacerbation. It was admitted, but he was discharged, but he returned to clinic because he continued to be symptomatic. And history is AFib on Coumadin, CML, creatinine is 1.9, STS is 5.4 for REOP AVR, and the frailty score was one out of five. And, you know, I have to bring this valve in valve app because Vinny's here, but the internal diameter of this is 17 millimeters. And the echo was sort of a mixed pathology. So there was a moderate AI. Um, it was not a paravabular leak. It was inside the strut. And the uh, mean gradient was 26.5. And the calf, um, I'll sort of summarize. The Lima to LAD was open. And the vein graft to the PDA or the RCA was open as well. But um, the left main was open. And the circumflex was open. So there's no blockage in that area. So circumflex is perfused by the native um, coronary artery. Um, Taver CT has good, uh, had a really good iliacs. Um, but when we looked at the VTC, which is virtual distance to coronary, when the valve was implanted, it was 3.1 millimeters. And I'll ask um, you know, Adam and Molly about this, the significance of that. The coronary height was 7.2 on that left side. So the circumflex that was still perfusing the lateral wall, uh, the coronary height was 7.2 millimeters. So to summarize, 78-year-old male, retired physician, status post AVR with 21 millimeter mitral flow, cabbage times two, SDS is 5.4, and the scan shows low coronary height and short, uh, short VTC. So the choices are valve and valve taver, valve and valve with basilica, valve and valve with basilica and balloon valve fracturing, Saver with root enlargement, Saver with freestyle, and for Vino others, if you have anything else. So, if you, you know, whoever wants to start first. Boy, um, that's not exactly a question that can be answered in one sentence. <laughs> right. A couple of issues. If you go back to the slide on the VTC. Yep. While the VTC is less than four, it's not zero. Um, and you do have a patent lima to your LAD, and there, there's no, um, it's not geographically isolated, if I'm correct, right? It would fill the cirque. Um, yeah, the, the lesions were relatively tight, um, but yes, um, you know. Is there a little stenosis in the, uh, in the proximal cirque, by the way? Yeah, it looks like yeah. it. So, yeah. so there certainly are some, some coronary issues, but if you go back to the other slide where you look at the SDJ height, what I can tell you, maybe it's this one, look at that leaflet. So it's not so much a VTC issue in this patient, but it's a VTSDJ issue, which is, I think the leaflet heights on this valve may be 14 or something like that. And um, it looks to me like if you do a, 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 a taver, a valve and valve here, that you may seal off that left coronary at the SDJ, which can present just as much of a problem. So if we were going to tackle 
of this patient with TAVR, we would perform Basilica at our center. Okay. So Adam, would you, about, do you, do you want, do you, are, do you care about the post and where the posts are? Sure. If the post of the, of the surgical valve. Can you just talk about, can you just talk about that a little bit, Adam? Yeah. How yeah. far off can it be? You know, should go to the cross-sectional yep. view. Right. So you're not exactly showing us the posts here, correct? Yeah, no, you're not. But, but no. nonetheless, most of the time, I'll give you guys credit. To you, you're great at lining up at least the left corner uh, in the middle of the posts. And we do try and get a midline split here. In this case, we don't have to be directly in front of the coronary because if we're only going to seal out the STJ, we just need to get flow into the sinus, which should fill it to the coronary. For me, the post in front of the, of the left makes it a little harder to split. Just in front of the left, if it is uh, a VTC issue. Um, the other thing is the post being in front of the coronary is more germane probably to the discussion on BVF. Uh, yeah. If you are going to fracture and push a post over, then obviously Basilica didn't, uh, didn't help you much. If you go to your other picture back to the longitudinal, um, you know, now you're looking at is there room in the LVOT for the safety of the BVF? You know, without seeing all the pictures, it looks like there may be. But I want to bring up one other point, which is this patient got a brand new mitral valve. And at the time, right, the true inner diameter was 17. And if they felt better um, with 17, right, and you did yeah, a... You uh, do better, yes. Yeah. So I think this concept of patient prosthesis mismatch, and we have to overexpand all these things. I mean, we, right, a mosaic, uh, 21 mosaic has the same internal diameter as 17. And there were many of them put in. So if you were to put in a, a TAVR valve uh, with basilica here and got a reasonable uh, gradient, uh, you might not need to do BF, but it does look like that there may be room to do it safely. No, I think, Adam, Bench, I, I agree with most of you. What you said is, uh, I'll just add a layer to that is if this patient you're doing with this, I would definitely keep, you know, cardiopulmonary bypass ready, FEM, FEM, et cetera, for support. Uh, but just to touch you on that, this is the exact confusion in science at present that the mechanical diameter is not EOA. So sure. that's not 17 millimeter mechanical diameter has nothing to do with the effective orifice area of a prosthesis. So a 17, so a 21 mitra flow EOA may be totally different than a 21 mosaic than a tower which you're going to put in. So. I think mechanical diameters confuse us sometimes and we still don't understand the relevance in terms of PPM, but they are not the same. So I think just to highlight that, sure. I think you may actually, we know that 17 millimeter mitra flows in the past we have done don't give us, you know, we don't get gradients lower than 20, I would say. What's the BSA for this patient? I'm curious. Um, I didn't put it on. Yeah, he was relatively He's close to two. All right, what's everybody going to do? We want, we want. That would, would none of you surgeons re-op on this? Is that Lima well, like directly oh, yeah. behind the, uh, is um, the Lima behind the sternum? I mean. Not that shouldn't worry. be a problem. Yeah. So my, my question to Molly and uh, Adam is, if suppose we decide to go through fracture, basilica, et cetera, would you still stent that proximal lesion in CERC as Venu pointed? Because if by chance you still obstruct it, now it's open, the mammary can, you know, uh, give it better perfusion. So I want to ask uh, Adam, before you even get to that, what valve would you put in this? Yeah. You would put a 23 Evolute or... Because this would be a 20 sapien. I mean, I guess you could, and if you put a 23, you would definitely have to BBF it. And you still run the same risk of what you were talking about with your, um, to even doing Basilica. So what valve would you? Right. So, uh, you, you know, look for the, for the BVF data, you probably could get this, the, you know, maybe what, three, four, um, you know, tops five millimeters expansion, but I don't, I don't count on that. So if you put a 23 in, you're really, you're right. really going to be under deployed. The problem with a 20, I would never put a 20 in this. Yeah, 20. Right. So, no. so if you put a 20 in and get it to a true 20 that, and I, and I agree with Vinny's points that, that they may not be the same. Um, but if you fully expand a 20, you may be better off than an under expanded 23. Now, normally I would say, okay, we'll go for the 23 Evolute, but, but you just have to think about the skirt height. There is a difference, right? The skirt height on an S3 right. the 20 is eight. The skirt height is 13, 13 on, yeah. on an Evolute. And if you look at that coronary, so it means in order to avoid the coronary from a skirt obstruction, you're going to have to place that maybe 
maybe uh, let's say six deep, and then that might eliminate the, the advantage of the super annular design if you have to yep. do six down. So it's not right. Really so I'm going back to again. Uh, to surgery and so far everyone I have said surgery so is this a hoax here uh, yeah or I'm <laughs> making the cardiologist a say uh, surgery and Molly these are the cases these are the cases Molly do you want to move to, do you, Molly do you want to move to Atlanta <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wait, wait, wait hold on first of all someone said that the cardiologists always say a uh, taver on this uh, chat feed but the answer is I did say surgery on the bicuspid <laughs> so I want that to be known that a cardiologist did say surgery but I would do uh, I, I mean I'd have to look at the pictures a little more carefully but I might offer this patient a valve and valve I didn't look at the right but at least valve and valve with basilica BVF and probably a 20s3 if I thought there was a spirit issue so I'm going taver on would you put a wire would you put a wire in the left main would you put I a wire not. in the left main? I would not. And as for the question about the the um, stenting, because you might not be able to get back in, that's an issue right. with commissural alignment of the new valves. If we could guarantee, if you split the, that leaflet and you had reasonable commissural alignment on your tabular valve, you will be able to get back through uh, and do what you need to do. Because that's this what the- This was a guy, about. right? Wait, so, so, yeah. so and based on Gilbert's data, I mean, you know, S3, you can't really line it up, at least I in know. this situation, right? I mean, then Evolute, you may be able to with the tab. I mean, would that change? I, I just have a problem putting a 20 S3 valve, valve in a. I do too. This Especially is a guy. A this is the other patient. Dude. <laughs> right. All right. So Molly says surgery. He notes says Taver. I'm going to say. Put a wire in. I'm going to say Saver, but no, I don't think you need root enlargement. I think you can put a 21 in spirits in this patient. You'll be fine. Uh, all right. Wait. Vinny, what do you say? I say send him to Atlanta to be new. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Uh, you I, I think uh, so this send is the him patient. to Atlanta to Greenbaum. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, honestly, my opinion is very simple. I mean, I like to keep things very simple. Is If I have a doubt that this patient with whatever tricks up the sleeve we have has a reasonable chance of problem and is reasonable risk for surgery, I would do surgery. Yeah, okay. But I think if there is any doubt, I would use all the parachutes available, whether it's Basilica, uh, right. whether it's a FemFem bypass during, you know, support needed. Because I think that the thing is, you know, we need to make sure that we minimize the bad outcome. And we know that coronary obstruction is a really bad outcome in these patients. It, it I think is. some of these cases we would, uh, as Vino suggested, put a wire down so we have access. So, all right, what'd you do, Yoshi? So here's what we did. Um, we did Basilica on this patient. So now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Adam, maybe you can explain this um, video a little bit. Um, we didn't use the pachyderm, but um, you know, the angulation was better for AL, so we use AL for this. And we struggle a little bit going through the leaflet, but um, this is when you burn. Um, and we went through the leaflet. You can sort of see at the end, and we capture it with a snare. And let's go to the next slide. And here, this is the part where you actually make a flying V and pull through the leaflet. You can see at the end that it pulls through um, nicely. And then we actually put a 23 um, core valve, Evolute. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And you can see and how, many, how yeah. deep are you? That's, on that's what I would have done. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't put a, a 20 S3 in. <laughs> Again, my only caveat was you just have to check the height for the skirt. And it looks yeah. like you're a few millimeters deep there, right? I can't. Yeah, and then yeah. You, about you, six, four or five. Yeah, these valve and valves, we tend to place it a little deep because we had one case where we did the BVF and it, um, you know, before yeah. it, it popped yeah. up. So, yeah. you know, we tried to you go in a little deeper in these cases and you right. can see that um, after the deployment you can sort of see the coronary filling in there yeah. so yeah. look at that yeah. look at the so were you not yes were you not worried about that circ lesion at all then really it just kind of looks like 50 percent. you leave it alone yeah we out, didn't um, touch it um he had no um no symptoms so you know based on all these ischemia data etc we tend not to aggressively treat these unless if they're symptomatic yeah if you play that last picture on the side, you can point out the opacity of the leaflet, how high up it goes. It's almost to that. Yeah, you can see it up to here. Yeah. So that's yeah. a, that's this STJ obstruction. Did you BVF this or no? Well, so that's my next slide. I'll show yeah. you. <laughs> so what was your gradient at the end of this? Yeah. Uh, oh, so this is the echo, 12, right? Yeah. But when we measured it with the cap, it was 15. Hmm. And we actually had a aggressive debate whether we should do a BVF versus not. Um, I was the one that was 
actually pushing for BVF, Vinny Cha, who my interventional cardiology partner, Vinny was the one that said, mm, maybe, you know, he's 78, creatinine 1.9, this is a good result, maybe we should hold off. And we got the echo the next day, and it was 20. Yeah. Yep. Right? Yep. We see that what are you thinking time. about it? Just yeah, do it. Gotta do it. Yeah. So you know, do it. Done it. No, I, <laughs> we didn't. She, he went home after the echo. So yeah. So we didn't. So let, let it gran let it granulate in, and then you can come back into it. There you go. <laughs> so that. there's a there's a question here so, uh, because you said very uh, like you had a case you did BVF and get embolized and the first uh, thing is with BVF. As it expands more, it shortens more, right? It's yeah. it's more of that shortening effect rather than the balloon yeah. pushing it up. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, and can, I ask, you, uh, can I ask Molly and Adam a little bit about this? Because we we're seeing this on table. You get this uh, thirty days, or the next day you get a much higher gradient. Have you been able to figure out when this is going to happen and when this is not going to happen? Because I think this is a really big issue, especially in valve and valves or tab and tab. How are, how are we going to predict this better so that we have an answer intraoperatively? Well, I think it always happens. It, it always so it happens, happens on a native case too. I mean, yeah, should, should, should we just add five? Should we add seven you, to it then? Well, yeah, I think, I think you have to really understand the work that Amar Abbas is doing and the trials yeah. that are coming out with, um, yeah. with these valves and trying to use the continuity equation to tell you what the gradient is. So I think, and this is why we do um, cath gradients on the table because that's a real gradient. I think whatever you get post-discharge post or on discharge, it's not necessarily truly a mean gradient of 20. But what you need to look for is that when the patient comes back, that it's the delta change in the gradient. So if the gradient when the patient comes back is 30, then you have a problem. But I don't think this is the true. I think if you took this patient with this mean gradient of 20 and took it back to the cath lab and crossed the valve, I think you're going to get your 15 or whatever it was that you had um, when you left the, the lab. Yeah. So okay. would, would, you, would you anticoagulate this patient? Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah we've been, been anticoagulating. Yeah, we co anticoagulate all valve and valve. Yeah. I mean, this are you using a NOAC or using a Coumadin? Coumadin. Because it's on Coumadin, it's it's on Coumadin but um, yeah. we, yeah, we'll we use Coumadin Noac. and sometimes Eliquis, but but those two. Okay. And there's a question from the audience: Would any of anybody have tried a 23 Lotus? No. Any experience with valve and valve with Lotus? Um, so there is means we use lotus, but we tend uh, we actually preferred lotus if it was a stentless valve uh, because it was very handy to use it in that. It's good for I, AI yeah. and all that. Yeah, and I think a uh, nineteen lotus or something is too small for this. Twenty yeah. lotus, I mean, yeah. Yeah, this would have been too. Yeah. I think I, don't, I think lotus is too big for this, right? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. too small. Vinny, would you worry about pinwheeling? Um, I want I want to talk about pinwheeling just you know for a second so that. Oh, I absolutely. Yeah, I think minutes. there is. Uh, this is why I'm saying I said before as well that you are you're going to get gradients about twenty in this patient. So, uh, seventeen ID and you know we have done this patients with sapien first generation, sapien XT, Evolutar, everything and. It it is not just Russian doll effect. It's I think uh, it just deforms the valve in general. It means your inflow may be elliptical or less, and then your mid flow portion, which may be you know you can actually balloon and make it bigger. But I think these pinwheeling will occur, and that's why anticoagulation I think might reduce some uh, valve thrombosis if there will be, and give you a longer um, uh, durability in these patients. That's the feeling at least. And Vina, would you anticoagulate also? Yeah, absolutely. I, I anticoagulate all valve valves for its Coumadin. Yeah. And is anyone using a NOAC? Yeah, I'll use, well, I mean, I'll use Eliquis if the patient has a, a strong preference for not Coumadin. Okay. Although there's no, no real data on any, any of this, and there is some data to suggest that NOAC might not be sufficient for for HALT, for example. It's hard to know though. Um, so there is one other case, I think in the interest of time, we'll, we'll skip it, but it was gonna focus on the, the population of patients that have concomitant coronary disease. And maybe uh, we could just get a quick insight on uh, um, from you guys, 
which patients or what degree of coronary disease is enough to push um, push you to sur to surgery over a TAB or PCI? Are you using syntax score? Are you using other things to determine that? Well, at eighty seven, I would say there's very little. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, I, agree. That, I mean, that, I, I, look, that, you know, that with PCI, yeah, yeah, because yeah. You, they've probably been fixed living with that disease for a while it's probably fixed coronary disease and then their shortness of breath comes from their tab you know from their as and if you fix their as they they'll feel better and then you, and, and again i your ability to get in and work on pc with pci and these people is is pretty good afterwards so this guy had a cto and i didn't get to you know, present it in full but he had a cto of his rca with moderate as uh and a low ef and was symptomatic with both primarily shortness of breath, but also some chest pain on exertion. He's a fairly active guy. He's a dan line dancer and, and d dances with his wife, and that's when he gets symptomatic. So you can see his left to right collateral. Um, so not, you know, his, his AS is kind of borderline. His mean grading, I think, was 22. His peak grading was 36. His velocity was under, uh, under three. And then he's got this occluded uh, right and, and a non-significant diag lesion. I mean, you showed that slide earlier. I guess you could also, again, look at SDJ height and, and sinus widths. And if you think you're going to be able to get back into both coronaries, you still could do CTO work uh, even after a TAVR. Yeah. So our cardiologist yeah. actually, um, I, I don't know if they actually tried, but they decided that he was not a, not somebody they uh, felt they could get a, uh, a CTO um, percutaneously. And so the patient, uh, so he was actually referred to us for surgery, and we, similar to you guys on the call, said he's 87. Why would we do that? So uh, we agreed to proceed with a TABR, and if that fails, then he'll get an off-pump cabbage to his right. And he had his TABR about a month or six weeks ago, and his symptoms have, have resolved. So he's yeah. He's, yeah. That's what we would have done, too. I, I, despite it makes his no only being that. moderate, you know, despite his, his AS by those criteria, by echo criteria. Now, his EF is also low. His EF was 30. So maybe some element of that was, uh, um, you know, low, low flow, low gradient. He looks, he looks like he has plenty of collaterals too. So he'll, right. be, he'll do great. Yeah, so wait, that was a little, okay. So Gorov, that presentation was a little under, so he probably did have low flow, low gradient AS and his EF dropped because of the AS. And so of course, fixing his AS would Although make- Although it wasn't I mean, totally clear. If you look at the CT, Yoshi, if you could put that up, it's not like he had a ton of calcium on his on his leaflets. You know, it didn't look like the worst valve. And even the, the cross-sectional echo, uh, short axis echo of his uh, aortic valve, it, it opened somewhat. So it, was, it wasn't clear that this was definitely going to help him. Do you guys um, use calcium score for these um, for these borderline cases? Yeah, but this would have been a low calcium score. Yeah, this would have been a low calcium. calcium. What was it? What was this dimensionless it. index? I missed, I missed a gradient. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what his dimensionless index was, but it wasn't that high. His gradient was here. You go. Twenty-two was his mean. Uh, yeah. Velocity. And you, do you guys? So is anybody getting DSCs anymore for these? We'll uh, do. Yeah, we'll do a. Um, We'll do a, D, a dobutamine stress. We'll also look at the dimensionless index. We yep. will um, use a calcium score. And if it's if we really feel like they have AS, I mean, we'll even take them to the lab. I just did one very similar to this that was moderate in every way, shape, or form that we tried, but then took her to the lab and I, went, I measured her gradient that way and her mean gradient was 40. Oh, and wow. we put a valve in and she so felt fair. better. But the topaz data would say, if it's right, if you mean gradients over 25, there wasn't much benefit. The only time we'll still do it is if, if someone's enter, if someone's entertaining the idea of low flow, low gradient, and you're getting a mean gradient of like 15 or something like that. Well, well I, I mean, but Adam, this is that patient, right? A mean gradient is 22 and the EF's 30, right? With not a ton of calcium. Not a ton of calcium, but it's symptomatic. So right. I'll tell you one thing. When we did take him to the lab to do his TABR, his, his cath gradient was no more than 18 at best. No. So it, yeah. it, it made us even pause, is this really going to help? And we proceeded, and I don't know if it's placebo. He says he feels a lot better now. Cool. You did the right thing.
Uh, 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 Never maybe. know. So I think <laughs> the theme of this is there's always there's not always a right answer, and I think it seems like the the heart team is really critical for each of these patients to try to figure out right. what might be missed. Um, but go go to a very quick comment actually, and this is is this because of TAVR our algorithm changing in such patients because we wouldn't have considered surgery in this patient, but now with TAVR becoming so safe and easy, and uh, I would say not day case but two day case procedure. Uh, is this going to change things? So I, I, I think, let me rephrase that. I think this patient, there probably are some of some people that would have operated on. But, but to answer your question, yes, no doubt, TAVR has allowed ac access to treatment of patients that we would not have treated before, no doubt. Right. I'm not sure many people would have operated on this patient. I have to tell you, Gaurav, at 87 would, in this uh, day yeah. and age, I, I actually don't know that yeah. many people would anymore. 30% of we, did in, think... we did in partner one. I don't think today in 2020, most of us would. Yeah, I mean, yeah. This, it all depends on the patient, right? They're 50 year olds you yeah. never would touch and there's 87 That's right. good. But you can't, yeah. No, no, I, I meant in specifically with low flow, low gradient kind of patients. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's yeah. a good point. No, yeah. I, that's a very good point. And yeah. low flow, low gradient, I, I think there's you know, probably a, an advantage to tablet. Mm -hmm. And I think the unload trial probably will answer some of these questions. I mean, uh, that's something people are looking at, right? Right. Great discussion. Excellent. Good. Thank, thanks for letting me do this on, on, on a beach and a, on a uh, balcony. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry that my dress is a little bit more casual. A little bit more casual than normal. That's right. This is the summer yeah. series. Vino promises. Well, it's yeah. I mean, Corona light. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much you. for uh, for thank excellent you. discussion here, and I would like to thank the audience as well. Um, it was a great session. It was a really fun session, actually. And thanks for uh, thanks for chiming in. I'm going to pass it to Gaurav. For yeah. Uh, to summarize, yeah, thanks uh, to our panelists. Outstanding discussion. Heart team is the the way to go. You can see there's no right answer for a lot of them, and surgeons still obviously should be really involved in uh, the treatment of aortic stenosis. Thank you all, and be safe. Thank you, Dr. Alwadi and Dr. Kaneko, and thank you to all our panelists today for your participation and insight. A reminder that the archived version of this webinar will be available tomorrow at sts.org, as well as on the STS YouTube channel and the STS Surgical Hot Topics podcast. Once again, we'd like to thank Medtronic for their support of this webinar and the STS Summer Webinar Series. We hope you'll join us on Thursday, July 30 at 5 p.m. Central Time for the next webinar in our summer series on the topic of looming Medicare cuts. Thank you all again and hope to see you back here later this month.